Good morning. Good morning. Check, check, check. There we go. Please rise in body or spirit for hymn number 1017 in the teal hymnal or on your screen. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. I became familiar with this quote by Margaret Mead by visiting the Fen House bathroom from time to time. I always noticed it and reread it because I thought it reflected concisely what is beautiful about life, community, and Unitarian Universalism. Like UU does generally, the quote reminded me, in a supportive way, of my responsibility as a human. The reason we're able to sit here in this building with one another today is due to the many small groups of thoughtful, committed individuals. The slideshow we reviewed before the service began, thanks to Rich Wolfson, are photos of these very groups who began gathering and working together almost 40 years ago to found, build, and sustain CVUUS. The work and pleasure of compiling oral histories of CVUUS will continue. Through this project, we learned about and became impressed with the involvement of CVUUS affiliated people 
outside of CVU US. With this in mind, the focus of today's service is beyond the walls of this building. We will take time to reflect on the seemingly tireless efforts that CVU US affiliated people have undertaken in the community. Their thoughtful and committed love and action has, in our opinion, changed the world. The community work done by CVU US congregants is vast and cannot be captured in a Sunday service. However, we have selected three stories to share today. Good morning. My name is Gail Borden. Welcome to Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. If this is your first time with us, we're very glad you're here. Please sign a card, a blue card, in the front hallway so we can send you additional information about CVU US. We will share milestones and passages today. Yellow cards for this purpose are near the entrance. If you have something you want our care team to know about, please fill out a pink card. All the cards go in the collection basket, as far as I know. Please make sure your phones are silenced and please join us downstairs after the service for coffee and refreshments. CVU US is led by our interim ministers, Reverend Christina and Reverend Tricia. I, together with Ben Long and Mike Greenwood, will be leading today's service. It occurred to the three of us that the values newly proposed by the Unitarian Universalist Association may be newly considered, but are quite familiar to the group of people who established CVU US. Like most important work, the path to create a church or to tackle issues such as the ones we are discussing today wasn't and isn't easy or obvious. May those who seek justice, equality, and transformative change be inspired by others who do so. Telling and listening to stories is a good place to start. We recognize that CVU US gathers on land seized from the Western Abenaki people by European colonizers. We respect the Abenaki's spiritual relationship to the land and waters of the Champlain Valley. We are committed to building a peaceful and more just relationship with them and to promoting knowledge about their history and culture. And now that it's part of our history, and also probably every congregation this morning, we will now light a chalice and say some words in unison. So Claire? So if you join me, the words are on the screen. Words from Dennis Whateley. If I had two wishes, I know what they would be. I'd wish for roots to cling to and wings to set me free. Roots of inner values like rings within a tree and wings of independence to seek my destiny. Let me take you back to the 1980s. The early years of CVU US were full of a number of families organizing themselves into a nascent community before there was a minister, the services like this one were all led by members of the community. Two of those founding families are represented here by Rich Wolfson and Abby Sessions. Thank you for joining me, both of you, to talk a bit about one part of that history. Rich and Abby, can you tell us a little bit about what influenced you to join with others to found a new church way back in the mid-1980s? <laughs> 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 
Well, it was kind of an anxious time then. There were many of us who were very worried about nuclear arms and the potential for nuclear war. And um, we had been attending Quaker meeting for some years and just were seeking um, a way of being in community with people with um, uh, like concerns, like-minded people, um, active people, and we also found that in, Quake, in the Quaker meeting there was no children's program, and we really wanted to come together with people and create a dynamic and wonderful uh, religious education program for our children. And some of us had roots way back in Unitarian Universalism, um, having been raised in, in that tradition. And uh, we also kind of missed that. And we wondered why it was that, uh, that Middlebury um, didn't have uh, a UU congregation. We were kind of surprised about that. Um, my personal take on that, and it's backed up a little bit by some histories of Middlebury College, is that um, Middlebury College was rushed into existence in the year 1800, partly to, by Calvinists from New Haven, from Yale, uh, partly to counter the um, Unitarian influence that was very strong in the founding of the University of Vermont. So we think, we think that may be part of it. <laughs> but we do know that there were Universalist churches um, in, in this area. The current Methodist church in East Middlebury was Universalist when it was founded in the mid-1800s, and there was a Universalist church in Shoreham. But there was no Unitarian uh, not much Unitarian presence here, and Unitarian and Universalism had pretty much faded away by the time the 20th century came around. So we really wanted to reestablish a tradition that we had grown up in. Thank you. And you both mentioned that you were attending Quaker meeting, and they didn't really have the the time for children and the the space for children that you were looking for. Are there were there other community organizations? like uh, I've heard maybe the Plowshares group that was working to abolish nuclear weapons um, that, that played a role in bringing people together and inspiring this new community. Well, um, Rich and Artley and I had a great conversation last night and just kind of getting our act together for telling the same story today. <laughs> 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 and um, we were wondering how how we found each other, not, not us, because we already knew each other, and we knew the other two couples who were involved in the actual call, making the call to Dean Starr to come and help us start a church. Um, and some of those social, social action organizations, we thought, were the connectors that brought people, brought the group, enlarged the group continuously. And it was amazing how quickly it all happened once we started, how quickly people found us. And I think maybe organizations like Plowshares were that connector. Yeah, and I would also add, um, some of us actually joined the UU Church in Burlington while we were thinking seriously about establishing this. Abby mentioned Plowshares, which was a group as the, the biblical Plowshares phrase, beat swords into plowshares, was trying to uh, strive for nuclear disarmament. And um, we were, all of us, pretty much involved in that. <clears throat> and in 1982, there was a move to put on the ballot at town meeting in Vermont towns a, a resolution uh, seeking a freeze on nuclear arms. And um, we worked in the town of Weybridge, and the Sessions worked in the town of Cornwall. And um, 177 of the 195 towns voted um, in favor of that resolution. We actually carried this sign in a 1982 peace march in New York City. So this is a sort of predates CVU US by a couple of years, but it indicates the kind of activism that has remained a part of CVU US. And while we're talking, I have another prop. Abby raised the question, how did we all get together? Um, Artley kept this green box, the very, this is the real thing, um, that she calls CVUS's very first home. So it, it, it predates the Sarah Partridge house, it predates 
the, build, the uh, Cornwall Town Hall, it predates the old Jehovah's Witness building, it predates this building, and she kept in this little note cards every time she heard of somebody who might possibly have a UU connection in the Addison County area, she put their name in this box. So this was our very first uh, home, and we drew on a lot of those names as we began to put this uh, religious society together. Thank you both for that. Uh, now, I'm, I'm pretty new here. Uh, our family just moved in 2020 and started attending services here after we were back in person from the pandemic. But I have heard that maybe there is a story uh, about tossing around an inflatable earth during a Memorial Day parade and even winning an award. Can you fill us in on that, Rich? Well, Abby and I were the primary tossers of that ball, as I recall, walking down the main drag of Middlebury during the Memorial Day Parade, tossing this big earth ball back and forth. And we... And not, not a beach ball, either. It was like... This. This. It was like this. It was big. It was big. Yeah, it was big. <laughs> and, and, and we were part of the plowshares contingent in the parade. But the wonderful thing about it is, in the end, we won the award for the best float. I'm not sure we had, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure it was a float and it's ironic that a peace, peace group won the award in the Memorial Day Parade and the award, which probably exists somewhere, I last saw it at the Sessions House, uh, was a statue of a general looking very serious and militaristic. <laughs> but I think that, that, that again, it illustrates that the theme of this service is some of the activism that this religious society has participated in. And that sort of tells you this activism was part of the real roots of the founding of this society. Thank you, thank you both very much. That's great. Thank you for your stories. Thank you for your work creating and sustaining a community that seeks justice. I'm sure, yes, I'm sure that Abby and Rich were not the only two members of CVU US who worked with plowshares to prevent nuclear war. And plowshares is not the only peace and justice organization supported by our community. Please, as you are able, raise your hand if you have ever organized or attended a protest or a march for justice. Oh, if you have ever donated money to uphold human rights, to end war, or to create a more peaceful world. Please raise your hand. Personally, this, all those hands, is a big reason why I want to put down roots in this community. This is a place where I see love in action, a place from which our children can stretch their wings and be set free.
All right. So, um, this is a time of graduations for a lot of people, speaking of using your wings. And my son, Milo, who grew up here in this RE congregation, graduated from high school yesterday. I know, those of you who have known him since he was very little, he's like this now, so it's, it still hasn't hit me. I don't think. <laughs> so uh, I want to show you something that happened at another high school graduation in Idaho a few weeks ago. And it involves someone named Annabelle Jenkins. And that is her. So there's three things, three things you should know about Annabelle. Number one. She does not like being the center of attention. I know, what, what's that about? Uh, number two, she loves libraries, like really loves them, volunteers in them, works in them, spends a lot of time in them. She's a huge reader. She loves books. She thinks libraries are a really important place, not just because of the books, but because of uh, everything else that they offer to people. So here's the story. In Animal's high school, in the district this year, and the district was 20, about 20 schools, some of the adults there wanted to remove some of the books from the libraries uh, because they didn't like the books. We call that banning books. Uh, well, not everybody. I call that banning books. Uh, when books are taken away from libraries so that people can't read them. So in this library, there was a graphic novel of the book, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, it's a book for older kids and grown-ups, I would say, which will come into play in the story. And it was a book that Annabelle felt was a really important book for people to read, for people to have access to. It's about like the right of women's bodies, for them to own their own body, basically. Uh, so she really loved this book and was in the library one day when a teacher came in and she overheard a, a fight, basically, that this teacher had with a librarian. Where the teacher was saying, this graphic novel is here, I just saw it on the shelf, it should not be here, it should not be in this library, it's inappropriate, blah, 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 blah. And she was doing it in such a way that Annabelle was pretty shocked because she had never heard a teacher be that way at her school. And so she and a bunch of other students decided that they did not think this book should be taken out and they were gonna try to fight it. So they formed a group they created an Instagram page, they made a petition, they started having meetings, they talked to teachers and parents and the other students, they met with the principal, and so far, I mean, people were at least listen, like willing to listen to them, and they, they realized, okay, maybe some of the younger kids shouldn't read this book, because the school went down to sixth grade. So maybe there's a compromise, like we put a label saying, you know, recommended for older people or something like that. Um, but then <clears throat> a small group of adults, which included the superintendent, so the person who is the biggest leader in the district, they stepped in. They were completely not willing to talk to the students. They had a private meeting. Um, no one was allowed to go except one teacher, no students, no parents. And at this meeting, um, well, let's let Annabelle tell you what happened. Video, please. Removed is the word the West Ada School District would use, and that is what they did with 10 books last December, including The Handmaid's Tale graphic novel. They were pulled from all school library shelves after a private meeting of administrators. In an email today, the district says their decision from last December would align with the recent library law passed by the Idaho legislature. But what Annabelle did at last week's graduation, she says she decided because of how she and her fellow students were not allowed to be part of the removal process. How we had been treated and ignored 
I just realized that I did not want to walk across that stage and get my diploma and shake the superintendent's hand. I just did not want to do that. So instead, she did this. When I got up there and I got the book out, um, and I kind of showed it to the audience really quick, he crossed his arms like this and he wouldn't take it. Annabelle dropped the book at Superintendent Derek Bubb's feet, which she believes added more fuel to the fire. It was a gesture and you're going to receive the gesture. If you want to make a bigger show out of it, be my guest. How big of a show? Well, that night, Annabelle posted her gesture on TikTok, thinking it would only be seen and shared by her friends and family. And I wake up in the morning to my dad shaking me and he says, your TikTok has a million views. And I went, well, what do you mean it has a million views? And what she means... It has blown up. ...is that 12-second video has been seen and liked by many millions of people. Don't take this the wrong way, but you don't seem like somebody who's going to be a rabble-rouser, somebody who's going to stir the pot. You seem like somebody who would not want to do that. No, you're absolutely right. I'm not a particularly outgoing person. I don't like public speaking. I don't like standing up and reading the passage aloud in class. I don't like to be the center of attention or do things just to like get a reaction. Um, so when I do things, I want it to be very purposeful. I want people to know that this is something deeply, deeply important to me. So since then, the TikTok video now has been seen uh, over 25 million times. So it completely went viral. It went all over the internet uh, very quickly. She ended up being interviewed by big newspapers like the Washington Post, Newsweek, People, The Independent, and there's a bunch of other ones too. If you just Google graduation book right now, this story will come up. <laughs> That's how big it got. So she didn't mean for millions of people to see what she did. She might not have even done it if she had realized that would happen, right? She posted it just for her friends. She just wanted to show the superintendent that what he had done was not okay with her. She felt really powerless, and this was something she came up with that she could do. But millions of people did see it and some of them will probably fight against books being banned in libraries. And if you look at her videos, there's tons and tons and tons of comments by people talking about her, um, you know, being brave and being a hero and being a good example and talking about their own experiences with libraries and books being banned. So it goes way, way, way beyond um, just, you know, her own action, right? Oh. I never told you what the third thing about Annabelle is. Number three, she is a Unitarian Universalist. So here she is bridging um, at her congregation in Boise, Idaho. So she just graduated as a senior, right? And so this is like what we did a couple weeks ago with our graduating seniors where we bridged. She grew up in her congregation, like my son Milo, um, and like the seniors who just graduated did. She was really involved in their RE program. She went through coming of age. She went through OWL. She went on a Boston trip. Like, she did a lot of things and helped do things with all the littler kids there. So, <clears throat> if you want to learn how to be brave and live your UU values, I encourage you to come be part of RE because the kids do great things there and they're happy to tell you and help you learn how to do that. Um, which really ties into the theme here, right? I mean, RE is about having roots that make you feel strong enough that um, you really know what your values are, right? So that's what happened with Annabelle, but then she also used her wings. Like the thing she did was not connected to her congregation or her uh, RE program or any other UUs at all. You know, she went off and did this completely on her own and that's what we're really going for, right? Is that all of you will be brave enough to go out and do things completely on your own. So uh, 
I hope you'll join us. Come find me during social hour if you're interested. You do not have to have any experience. You'll never be alone. You'll always have a buddy. Uh, and now let's go to Ari. So this is the time the kids will leave with me and we will sing. My favorite part of the service, because we're going to call ourselves in for a second. So we're going to take a moment of silent reflection. And what I'd ask, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes and take a deep breath. Let it in and take, let it out. And if you're able to, at the same time, Gail, Ben, and I would like you to consider this question. Why are you here? What makes this place stick for you? And that question was one of the very first questions asked of the group that assembled to form this congregation. Why are you here? And then we're going to take five shout out. And we have two newer members who will pass the mic. So in two minutes, we'll begin. So do we have five, five people who would like to share? Why are you here? Anne? As I thought about that question, uh, I, I, I welcomed being part of a group that uh, that was totally accepting of myself um, to allow me to just be myself and, and be part of community. And I also welcomed that it was a gr group of people who were thinkers and doers. Today is my birthday. And as I thought about where I want to be, who I want to be with, I came home. This is home. You are my community, and that's why I'm here. Um, this is from Liam. 
he says, I'm here because of people like Dorothy Mammon work to make it possible for me to marry Mike Greenwood. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm here because you guys are my people. And you're my people because you are people who are working hard to be your best selves and working hard to make the world better for everyone. We have time for one more. I'm here to see and be with and reflect on my relationship with each of you and look forward to getting to know those of you I don't know and for letting you get to know me. Thank you all. This is the part of our service where we take a collection. The collection is shared between two groups. One is us, and the other is Outright Vermont. Outright Vermont is dedicated to creating a better future for LGBTQ plus youth in our state. We strive to build, according to the website, they say, to build relationships and provide resources that foster acceptance and community giving queer youth a safer place in Vermont to live and to enjoy life without fear. Please be as generous as you're able.
milestones and passages. It seems that maybe someone online celebrated a 95th birthday in North Carolina. Happy birthday, Jean, who is, by the way, Tom's mother. This one from Jean Terwilliger. Jean says, on this morning celebrating our congregation's love in action, the donations team would like to thank the congregation for your over $21,000 in sharing the plate donations in 2023. You are amazingly generous. Please see Jean Terwilliger after the service if you would like to help choose future donees. From Dinah Smith. On behalf of the CVUUS Meditation and many others, I thank the board, the finance team, staff, and the many parts that keep CVUUS working in all the important ways we do. We have special thanks to Ted Shai for this work to keep the outside beautiful. Last Saturday, especially, his work. And from Marnie, Marnie Wood. Congratulations to Milo Reese and his tennis doubles partner who came in second at the state tennis doubles tournament last Saturday in Burlington. The winning team was also from Middlebury Union High School. So the championship doubles game was two Middlebury Union High School doubles teams against each other. Friday, the MUHS tennis team won the preliminary tournament and will compete in state competition this coming week. That's the boys tennis team. Let us take a moment to hold these milestones and passages in our hearts, including all those messages that were unspoken. This conversation is about death with dignity, or as the law is referred to in Vermont and many other places, medical aid in dying. The law allows people with chronic illnesses under very specific conditions to hasten the end of their lives. While Marnie Wood has a particular story, an amazing story, I know there are others of you who are experienced with this issue as well, in one way or another. I'm so grateful to you, Marnie, for sharing your story about your sister. I know you cared, cared for her and ultimately helped see her through to what you described as a beautiful death. You told me this path wasn't one you ever thought you'd take, but one you clearly accepted with grace and fortitude. Could you tell us how you ultimately brought the human side of this issue to the development of policy and ultimately the passage of a law in Vermont? Well, first I'd like to say that um, the reason I'm here, not just standing talking to you, is because I dropped in to visit my sister uh, a number of decades ago and she was worshiping at Quaker meeting and followed those tr intrepid um, Quaker folks who eventually brought us um, to CVU US. And I had dropped in to visit my sister and decided to stay. So I um, also, I wasn't there in the very, very beginning, but soon I was. My, sister's journey 
was one of, um, and many of you know this story, but for those of you that may not, um, my sister eventually was um, diagnosed with ALS, and I cared for her here in Middlebury, and then um, she returned to Portland, Oregon, where her two children were, and she knew of Oregon's death with dignity law, and she knew that continuing to live out her life um, with the almost total limitations that she had, except not in her brain, she was totally competent, and did hasten the end of her life um, in Oregon using the law there. And I have often shared with people that she truly had a beautiful death. Um, the family supported her. She was um, only 58. And I promised her, she definitely wanted her experience um, to matter in some important way, and I promised her I would do that. I wasn't sure how, <laughs> but um, that is what came to fruition because I did know that Vermont was considering medical aid in dying, and some of you may not realize, but it did take um, more than 10 years for Vermont becoming the first legislature in the country to pass a medical aid in dying law. In 2011, during that legislative session, the, there was an informational meeting at Town Hall Theater um, regarding medical aid in dying, and people from the audience were encouraged to ask questions. After about eight people got up and only spoke about opposing the law, I was very stirred up and decided to raise my hand and I shared my sister's journey, her family supporting her and her beautiful death. At the conclusion of the meeting, a member of Patient Choices Vermont came up to me and said, don't leave the building. And right after, that was Ginny Walters, right after that, um, John Flowers of the Addison Independent rushed up to me and said, don't leave the building. So two things happened from all that. Um, I became acquainted with Patient Choices Vermont, and John Flowers wrote excellent coverage of that meeting. And through Patient Choices Vermont, I was able to start speaking about end-of-life choice using my sister's experience. And Barnaby, Reverend Barnaby, our former minister, did a service on end-of-life choice in February of 2013. And he knew that I, he well knew that I would be a good source of um, offering a reflection, which I did at uh, service in early February, while the legislature was um, seriously considering, again, um, a medical aid and dying law. So I thank Reverend Barnaby for allowing me to share my story at that point in time, and I'm sure some of you heard me. Um, but the important thing that came from me sitting down and writing about my sister's journey was the fact that that became the basis for my testimony at the state legislature um, to the two different committees um, in the House and uh, Senate. The, um, when you grow up in California, you are very clear about more than likely never testifying at the state legislature. It's, it's just too big a state, of course. Um, so the legislative realities that we have here in Vermont are so available. Um, so I spent many um, days going to Montpelier. I 
as I said, I testified several times, and the Senate, um, our longtime serving Addison County State Senator Claire Eyre was the lead sponsor of the Senate's bill, S-77. And it passed out of committee and was discussed on the floor, and she was the senator who was answering all the questions and doing marvelously well because she was so committed to this happening. And the morning that it passed, Claire and my, I knew Claire because of my sister Nancy. They had their two sons as toddlers in a play group that Aunt Marnie was also part of. And so it was really so fabulous that Claire was championing this bill and um, she did a beautiful job. So from the passage on the Senate floor, it went to the House. I testified there before the committee, sat in on a lot of committee meetings. And the day that, um, yes, good. <laughs> That's the slide. Uh, if you haven't been to the State House, perhaps many of you have, but um, the House Chamber also has seats for the Senators when they are uh, doing both together. And so take a look at, on the far right, those large red chairs are where all the Senators sit, 15 on each side of the podium. But when the Senators are not there because they're in their own chamber um, doing what they should be doing, Guests for um, activity in the House are allowed to sit in those large, red, velvet-looking chairs. And so I was sitting there with Dick Walters and uh, the president of Patient Choices Vermont on the day that the House of Representatives were uh, discussing and voting on um, Senate Bill 77. Dick leaned over to me as the voting um, commenced, and he said, Marnie, I want you to take a tally of how everybody's going to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> I really wanted to pay attention to who was voting in which way because I'd come to know many of the um, representatives. So I did both. And, and we, he kept checking my tally sheet, and, and um, as we progressed to realizing that the bill A was more than likely going to pass by a good margin, um, and then it did pass, and then we waited um, anxiously for the appropriate conclusions of um, the announcement of the votes and then the speaker announcing that the bill had passed, and you can imagine the joy that I experienced that day because I had made a promise to my sister and I felt like it really had come to fruition. Uh, the House went into um, recess or um, anyway, I know there are all these appropriate terms and I know there are people in this <laughs> room that know them perhaps better than I do, but the, one really rewarding thing was that various representatives came up to Dick, who had championed this from so, for so many years, and, and they spoke to me as well and said, the two of us sitting there, and especially me having told my sister's journey, um, it gave them additional courage to vote their, um, their minds in an appropriate way. So um, that was probably, in a certain way, the pinnacle of reality and um, Okay, <laughs> I think I'm avoiding you having a part in this, <laughs> but well, thank you, Marnie. I, I think one last question would be: uh, since then, since the passage of the bill, there's can you very probably briefly, but let us know what's happened because that was ten years ago, but the, it didn't stop then. The work and the right so. After, uh, in 2013, I was asked to join the board of Patient Choices Vermont. So last year, and I still am a member, and last year um, it was decided through a legal case that out-of-state residents 
could also have access to um, Vermont's Act 39 um, life cho end of life choices. Um, and so that was fabulous. Thank and you. Um, just at our board meetings, um, the amazing number of people who are calling about medical aid and dying and wishing to know more and the number of people that this has um, reached out to. There are 11 jurisdictions in the United States that have medical aid and dying as a legal right of citizens. And um, anyway, so that's, Thank you. that's an update. Thank you so much. We apologize for 11 o'clock for those of you who may have to leave. <clears throat> but before I begin, I'd like to give you a little context. The Marriage Equality Act is a 2009 Vermont state law that legalized officiating of marriages between same-sex couples in the state. The law went into effect on September 1st, 2009. Vermont became the fourth state to legalize same-sex marriage and they're first to do so by legislation rather than a court ruling. So we're curious, by a show of hands, how many of you here were involved in testifying, volunteering, donating, or just by offering your support for marriage equality here in Vermont? Wow, it's amazing. Look around at the number of people. What a living testimony to your commitment to, oops, sorry, commitment to, What a living testimony to your commitment to ensuring equal rights for all. And what a legacy to have, one of many that we have in this congregation. I think everyone here today and on Zoom can agree that Vermont is a beautiful place. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why we choose to reside here. Mention you are from Vermont and people will often respond with, you are so lucky beautiful state. We go every year and wouldn't miss foliage season. We make it a weekend trip and buy our maple syrup here. We would never have any other. Our family has a condo in Menden and we are in Vermont every month skiing, hiking, and swimming. You must feel so fortunate to live in a beautiful place. To be sure I do feel fortunate to live here. I take immense pride in the fact that I was born here, even if most of my life was spent in Southern New England. But contrast that with this. Would you live in a state where the state police advises the governor to wear a bulletproof vest when visiting certain parts of his state? Where politicians threatened by slogans, we will remember and we will vote you out. And those threats are not delivered just by mail or by phone, but while you're doing your weekly grocery shopping with your three kids at the local IGA, protesters consistently following you up and down the grocery aisle, making you so concerned about the safety of your children that you leave with them in tow. Live in that state? I think not, not one I would choose. 
or live in a state where a movement propelled individuals to, to deface their classic red barns? And the statements are big and bold, take back Vermont from the Flatlanders, undo civil unions, gay marriage, not in my state. And in Franklin County, I saw this painted on one of those classic red barns, fags out, cows in. But here we are in Vermont, a state with picture perfect photos that we find on calendar after calendar, image of a tranquil rural life where neighbors share vegetables, wave to one another, and there seems to be a red barn around every corner, or so it seems. A state with resistance and hate just underneath all that beauty that pits neighbor against neighbor, where some are afraid to share their views and others shout out those who do. Where arrogance dominates the landscape, I know I'm right in my belief and you are not. And for some, I know that God is on my side, not yours. David Motes, who is here today with us, writes in his book, Civil Wars, I was in California for a short time, visiting with four old friends. We were having dinner at a restaurant in Oakland, and I was trying to explain the fury that overwhelmed my state. And leaving Vermont behind for a week, I felt I had escaped a war zone. Let me repeat that. And leaving Vermont behind for a week, I felt as though I had escaped a war zone. I felt I had escaped a war zone. It was a political, social, and cultural war unlike anything I had ever experienced. Poppy shared the story earlier this morning of Annabelle Jenkins and her desire to preserve the integrity of librarians, not politicians, to choose the books on their racks. Well, imagine my surprise when doing some research on marriage equality here in our state that I discovered we actually have two Annabelle Jenkins, two of them, in our own congregation. And they are Johanna Nichols and Dorothy Mammon, both members here, and Johanna, a former settled minister. Johanna, along with an openly gay minister from St. Johnsbury, a UU minister from Derby Line, along with a few others, rallied to their colleagues across the state to sign a petition supporting gay marriage. The goal was 100 signatures. According to the Advocate newspaper, 182 clergy members representing nine different religious denominations signed the declaration. It was an incredible feat and a testament to Johanna's passion for ensuring marriage equality became the rule of the day here in Vermont. She continued her work advocating, cajoling colleagues and friends alike to support gay marriage. We are forever indebted for what she has done. The other Annabelle Jenkins is our very own Dorothy Mammon. I knew Dorothy was involved in the Freedom to Marry in initiative, but I never imagined how big of a role she had, along with so many others in this congregation. Dorothy was not just an advocate. She was a statewide coordinator for the Freedom to Marry Task Force. So let's hear from her. The testimonies were two minutes apiece, so it could have been, it could have been multiple yeah. people yeah. from our congregation testifying yeah. too. And it wasn't just gay and lesbian people that testified, straight people testified mm -hmm. about why it wasn't fair and why, how they felt about being able to be married when their friend sitting right next to them couldn't be married out of, you know, that was right. terrible, and um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so lots of people went to testify. Yeah. So if you could, I'd like to go back to the fair, because um, in David Moat's book, he mentions you at Tunbridge and feeling threatened by, by the people across the way yeah. who were against gay marriage. Well, there were a couple right. of things at fairs, but at Tunbridge, so, what happened was, um, some fairly big guys, maybe four fairly big men, mm -hmm. um, had Take Back Vermont signs, you know, which are mm. also big, yeah. and they and they had them, and they s stood, you know, like maybe they were as far away as the chairs over there, and then they kind of walked toward the booth, and I, I was alone at that time. Usually we were at the booth in pairs. Mm -hmm. it just somebody I had to go to the bathroom or whatever, you know, but I yeah. was alone there, and then they were saying, terrible things like you don't belong in Vermont, you know, to, you know, you know, 
well, compare, you know, I don't mm. want to say the things they said you can imagine. And, um, and it felt pretty threatening. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know quite what I was going to do or what they were going to do. And um, before I knew it, um, the police came in and, and, and told them to get out. And, um, and after they were dispersed, somebody uh, from a neighboring booth came over and said, I may or may not agree with you, but nobody deserves to be treated like that. Wow. So I thought, well, that is really the Vermont spirit. Yeah. Like, yeah. That yeah. is a live and let live. Yeah. But kind of where did you find after an incident like that? Where did you find the courage to go out again? I mean, th that takes a lot of oomph. Um, well, interestingly, Mike, that only gave me more courage because, okay. um, because because that is just so wrong. Mm -hmm. That is just so wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it, and I know that if I'm experiencing that, uh, any gay and lesbian person in Vermont could be experiencing that. And and it's just so wrong. And so mm -hmm. if anything, it just extra motivation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. So let's return to those opening images of beauty and tranquility and in contrast to the verbal and physical threats targeting others. So how do you navigate this? How do you compose and maintain decorum? So I'd like to share two brief stories. Uh, one involving two members of this congregation, Judith and Thelma, who went to testify the state legislature. And there they are in line to speak in favor of marriage equality, and they look over to the opposing line, and they find their babysitter the child care. So they had to wrestle with, what do we do? <laughs> She's caring for our infant, and little did we realize that she opposed us as a lesbian couple and was not in favor of us having the right to marry. The second is the minister that Johanna approached, who said, oh my goodness, yes, yes, gays deserve to be married, lesbians deserve to be married. For all I know, one of my grandchildren, I have seven of them, could be gay or lesbian, but I can't sign it because I'm afraid of losing my big donors. So how does one pers persevere when threatened physically, verbally and physically, not just on one occasion, but in multiple places, where it could occur, what roots grounded Dorothy, enabling her to continue that work? On first read, you might be saying to yourself, well, these three points I'm going to share with you are pretty obvious, but I would say that they're not always easy to maintain or to keep, and it's easy to bear away from them. So Dorothy suggests the following. One, hold tight to your moral compass. She says, it's just plain wrong to hate. It is just wrong. To deny anybody any rights is just wrong. Echoes of our first principle inherent worth and dignity and our second justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. But also help us positive moments like the one she experienced at Rutland, um, I'm sorry, Essex Champlain Valley Exposition walking down the aisle towards her booth was a farmer in overalls with his daughter. The daughter stopped in the booth and looking at Dorothy, let loose a diatribe of very hateful things, things that she would not even repeat to Margie and I. After she left, the farmer leaned over and said quietly, I think people should be able to marry whoever they want. That brings us to Dorothy's second compass, Never, never make assumptions. Again and again, she was taken aback by the assumptions she had made as to who would support and who wouldn't. In her third compass, the strength she received from you here. So all the people who raised their hands and probably many others that are not here with us today, you provided Dorothy with the courage and the strength she needed, Sunday after Sunday. Marriage equality has been achieved here in Vermont. Many lessons have been learned from this initiative, and those are being aptly applied, applied today to the trans right, 
rights movement. So let us band together in this season of pride. Let us remember the cornerstones of how to navigate this tidal water of hate that may surface. Let's hope it doesn't. Let's find strength with others. Don't make assumptions and keep your moral compass pointing to the values of love, justice, and equity. So may it be. Our closing words. We're actually going to skip to him, I think, because of time. Sorry about that. Closing words. We have a rich history. In just over 35 years, look at what you have accomplished. But not to be overlooked is our, your rich history in living our values, independence, equity, and justice, just to name a few. Those values are what brought us together and it's what binds us today. May these roots plowshare, right to die, marriage equity, and so many others be the roots that ground us in believing we can make a difference in this world because we already have. And we believe we're poised to do so again. Let it be. I'd like to introduce two members of this congregation, the Burninghausens, um, who are going to do a paired reading. And what I'm, we're going to ask you to do, if you are comfortable in so doing, is to stand for this closing and to either hold hands, if you're comfortable doing so, or touching elbows. Um, it's because we would like to see us all come together as a single community. And we're going to read the last verse. Um, and it will be on the screen for you. Before, before we start to read with your permission, I am spontaneously moved to thank Poppy and all the members who've, been, who've organized this, this service, my Gail. Uh, uh, and you may not know, I'm the son of a librarian the McCarthy movement started exactly the way that brave young woman in Idaho pushed back. But it was the sad part of the story we heard was this time the librarian was being attacked by a teacher, a fellow teacher. 80 years ago, it was coming from parent groups telling the librarians and the school systems, take those books off the shelf. And I just want to urge everyone to remember, whatever the book is, it's wrong to tell the librarian, get that book off the shelf. It offends me. I don't agree with it. And it's wrong when it comes from our side of the aisle, just as much as when it comes from the conservative right wing side of the aisle. Again, we reground ourselves here in our highest values. Love is the center and foundation of this faith. Love is the power that holds us together as a community. As we enter our communities, let us open our hearts to the healing power of liberating love. Because love is not only something we receive, but is something we practice in community. Let fall away all that might distract us from the wholehearted practice of love. Let us be accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. As we continue to listen and learn to act and grow, grow. may we may each unfold, unfold in wholeness, in wholeness both, both deeply loving and, and truly, truly love. love. Amen. And blessed be. Thank you.
Gonna keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. Sigamos adelante. Siempre adelante, siempre adelante, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Gonna keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly. Keep on loving boldly, never turning back, never turning back. Amaremos con pasión, siempre con pasión, siempre con pasión. Across our border, reach across our border, reach across our border, never turning back, never turning back. Vivamos sin fronteras, siempre sin. Siempre sin fronteras, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Gonna reunite the family, reunite the family. Familias reunidas, siempre reunidas, siempre reunidas, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Can I keep on moving forward? Keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, never turning back.